A nuclear power is the use of nuclear reactions that release nuclear energy to generate heat. This energy most frequently is used in steam turbines to produce electricity in a nuclear power plant. Nuclear power can be obtained from nuclear fission, nuclear decay, and nuclear fusion reactions. In fission, energy is gained by splitting apart heavy atoms, for example uranium, into smaller atoms such as iodine, cesium, strontium, xenon, barium. On contrary, fusion is combining light atoms, for example two hydrogen isotopes, deuterium and tritium, to form the heavier helium. Both reactions release energy which, in a power plant, would be used to boil water to drive a steam generator, thus producing electricity. Fission is the nuclear process that is currently run in nuclear power plants. Nuclear power plants are thermal power stations which generate electrical energy from heat. They consist of numerous buildings and facilities, the most important of which are as follows. The turbine building houses several turbines as well as the generator necessary for electrical power generation. The containment building where the nuclear reactor is housed is made of meter-thick, reinforced concrete. Inside this building, nuclear reactions take place where water is heated up. The cooling tower, which can be as tall as 200 meters, is where hot water is cooled. In order to easily understand the underlying principles, the following is a description of the most important components of a nuclear power plant that uses a pressurized water reactor, PWR. In the reactor pressure vessel, the nuclear reaction and the associated release of thermal energy takes place. In a pressurized water reactor, as in this case, the reactor pressure vessel stands about 12 meters tall. The walls are about 25 centimeters thick. Inside is where the fuel assemblies can be found. In pressurized water reactors, about 150 such assemblies are installed. A single fuel assembly is composed of many fuel rods. A fuel rod is about 5 meters in length and has a diameter of about 23 centimeters. The actual nuclear fuel is found inside of each fuel rod. Small nuclear fuel pellets composed of enriched uranium or plutonium make nuclear fission chain reaction possible. In the fission chain reaction, thermal energy is released. Water is needed in order to absorb the thermal energy and keep the chain reaction going. Inside the vessel, the water is heated to over 570 degrees Fahrenheit. The water does not boil, however, since the pressurizer maintains the water pressure constant at around 160 bars. The heated water is eventually pumped to a heat exchanger, also called steam generator. These are typically in the form of a shell and tube heat exchanger. Hot water flows through the U-tubes, heating up the metal of the pipes so that any water inside the heat exchanger begins to boil. The resulting steam is eventually fed through a set of pipes to the turbine building. The steam first drives a high-pressure turbine and then is typically fed to two low-pressure turbines. All of the turbines are connected by a spinning shaft to the electrical generator, which in turn produces AC electricity from the shaft's rotational energy. The steam is converted again into liquid form in a condenser and then returned back to the steam generator. The water needed for this often comes from an adjacent river or is cooled in a cooling tower. The water circulation systems are always kept separate from one another. Water in the primary circulation system never leaves the containment building. This water is radioactive since it has been in direct contact with the fuel rods. 
water in the secondary circulation system is used to drive the turbines and is not radioactive. The cooling circulation system provides cool water and is used to condense the steam in the secondary circulation system. Unlike nuclear fission, the nuclear fusion reaction in a tokamak is an inherently safe reaction. The reasons that have made fusion so difficult to achieve to date are the same ones that make it safe. It is a finely balanced reaction which is very sensitive to the conditions the reaction will die if the plasma is too cold or too hot, or if there is too much fuel or not enough, or too many contaminants, or if the magnetic fields are not set up just right to control the turbulence of the hot plasma. Scientists researching magnetic confinement fusion aim to use a plasma device called Stellarator as a vessel for nuclear fusion reactions. The name refers to the possibility of harnessing the power source of the stars, including the sun. The Stellarator was invented by American scientist Lyman Spitzer of Princeton University in 1951, and much of its early development was carried out by his team at what became the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Lyman's Model 8 began operation in 1953 and demonstrated plasma confinement. Larger models followed, but these demonstrated poor performance, suffering from a problem known as pump-out, that caused them to lose plasma at rates far worse than theoretical predictions. By the mid-1960s, Spitzer was convinced that the Stellarator was matching the Bohm diffusion rate, which suggested it would never be a practical fusion device. Since the 1990s, the Stellarator design has seen renewed interest. New methods of construction have increased the quality and power of the magnetic fields, improving performance. A number of new devices have been built to test these concepts. Major examples include Wendelstein 7X in Germany, the helically symmetric experiment in the US, and the large helical device in Japan. There are mainly two problems when it comes to fusion, the heat transfer and the magnetic confinement. In a nutshell, fusion reactors are nothing more than glorified pressure pots using high-tech stuff. The concept of energy production is very similar to fission light water reactors. The main difference is that fusion releases more energy. We have complete control over the reaction, meaning if we stop feeding the machine with fuel, the reaction stops immediately. And lastly, it's not nearly as radioactive as fission. In essence, fusion can be achieved by heating atoms with 20 kilo electron volts, and when they fuse, they release more or less 20 million electron volts. From that, you get a neutron with 14 million electron volts that leaves the plasma and it's captured by the blanket which transfers the heat to a coolant, which can either be liquid like water or gas like helium. This is why the heat transfer is a problem. In the case of the 7X, it's one of the things that they are working on methodically to get it right in the next few years. The blanket's job is to make sure that the heat transfer happens precisely while protecting the outer parts of the machine. Remember, we are talking about extreme temperatures separated only by a few centimeters. Graphite is a good candidate for the blanket, but the problem with it is that if it decays due to the high temperatures, it will contaminate the plasma, hindering the fusion process. The alpha particle that is emitted with 3.5 million electron volts remain in confinement to continue heating up the plasma. Now you are probably asking, so if you need only 40 kilo electron volts and you get 3.5 million electron volts, that is more than enough to get fusion going. Why don't we have fusion yet? Well, the answer is quite simple. Not all atoms fuse, which is a problem with the confinement. Then we must also understand that more than 80% of the heat generated is used to make electricity, while 20% keeps the plasma hot. Although you don't need much energy to initiate fusion, you do need the atoms to collide, and for that you need to increase the likelihood of collisions to happen. That is when the magnetic confinement comes into play. How a tokamak works is straightforward. You have a toroidal chamber, which is a giant circular tube or torus, with coils all around it like a solenoid. This enables the plasma to be confined in a toroidal magnetic field, so the plasma moves in a circular pattern. The problem with this approach is that the confinement is skewed towards the center of the torus due to the nature of the system, and for a tokamak to be successful, we need to even out the confinement. To do that, we introduce a second electromagnetic field using a transformer. This generates a current inside the confinement chamber making the plasma twist, which evens out the distribution and also heats it up. The system has several disadvantages, one of them being the length of the wires for the coils. 
like I mentioned in my other video, they used 100,000 kilometers of niobium tin and or niobium titanium for that. If you want more information about this, I suggest you watch my video about fusion. Another disadvantage is the drifting of atoms due to the magnetic confinement. What this means is that the charged particles eventually are trapped by orbits that throws them out of the desired fusion orbit, or they drift away from the magnetic lines to which it was supposed to follow in the first place. Basically, deuterium and tritium are lost because of this, significantly decreasing the chances of fusion. To overcome this problem, they have to make the magnetic confinement stronger, which means bigger machine. Now you understand why ITER is so massive. The Wendelstein 7X offers a more elegant but complex solution to these problems. Although we all think that stellarators are something new, they are as old as tokamaks. Lyman Spitzer Jr. was the man behind the idea. What he tried to do was to find a way to eliminate the drifting of atoms in tokamaks like I explained earlier. His key insight was to understand that by twisting the shape of the plasma, it would somewhat eliminate the drifting. So he devised an experiment by turning the torus into an eight-shaped tube. In his first try, he managed to heat the plasma to 500,000 Kelvin, but not much more was concluded. Keep in mind that this was during the 1950s, so achieving 500,000 Kelvin was quite a feat. His second big insight was to realize that the H shape was not necessary. What he really needed was to introduce helical field coils with currents at alternating directions throughout the length of the torus. This alone would create the desired twisted magnetical field, giving birth to the classical stellarator. Although this was a clever insight, the problem of drifting atoms is still there. It was only with the advancement of computers that the stellarators regained credibility. Supercomputers gave scientists the ability to understand how plasmas behave in extreme electromagnetic fields, and by that, they were able to design what is now the 7X. Shaping the magnetic field is crucial to any reactor, and the 7X shines because of that. It is comprised of a 5-fold symmetry torus that helps shape the plasma field lines. This is important because it enables the machine to handle longer plasma times without the need of extra power. This approach is more elegant than tokamaks for a few reasons. It eliminates the necessity of a transformer to twist the magnetic field, which dramatically decreases the amount of energy required by the machine. While either will have a total magnetic field of 13 tesla, the 7x can work with only 3 to achieve the break-even state. Or so they hope. Wiring for coils are only a few hundreds of kilometers when compared to either's 100,000 kilometers. This has also an impact on time to build the machine, since getting this much wiring took almost 8 years for ITER. Stellarators can achieve stronger magnetic fields that do not require bigger machines to be obtained. Because of that, confinement is many times better than tokamaks. Stellarators can operate at steady states much better, because it has less magnetohydrodynamic activities at nearly disruption-free states. Another advantage is the steady state magnetic fields and the absence of current driven instabilities and disruptions, something that is an intrinsic problem with tokamaks, another reason why they have to go with bigger machines. Lastly, is cost. If it all goes well with the 7X, which is only a proof of concept, building a stellarator that can produce energy won't cost nearly as much as a project like ITER. Further optimizations such as going from a 5-fold symmetry to a quasi-symmetric 4-fold symmetry, which helps eliminate harmonics and produce a field line with single harmonic symmetry, may help achieve that, because it effectively eliminates toroidal curvature and dramatically improves particle confinement. So far, the 7X has been successful in every test, and the last upgrade for its final phase is the installment of the actively cooled diverter using CFC. This will enable the machine to handle plasmas for up to 30 minutes, and it should be ready by 2020. The future of stellarators depends on this final test, and if it all goes well, either will look really bad. Why is Sishin better than Fusion? 
there are plenty of nuclear fission reactors that actually provide useful energy. As of now, there are zero useful fusion reactors. It turns out that nuclear fission isn't actually too difficult. If you take some uranium-235 and shoot a neutron at it, the uranium absorbs the neutron and becomes uranium-236. However, this uranium-236 is unstable and will break into pieces to give you nuclear fission. Even better, it also creates extra neutrons to break apart even more uranium. Oh, you can also do this with plutonium and thorium. Fusion, on the other hand, is very difficult. Instead of shooting a neutron at an atom to start the process, you have to get two positively charged nuclei close enough together to get them to fuse. Without the electrons, atoms have a positive charge and repel. This means that you have to have super high atomic energies to get these things to have nuclear fusion. High energy particles are the problem. This is why fusion is difficult, and fission is relatively simple. Why is fusion better than fission? There are a couple of problems with fission reactors. First, the stirring material. These starting materials aren't just laying around. In fact, if you went looking for some natural plutonium you wouldn't find any. The only way to get plutonium is to make it. The other problem with fission is the products. After this nuclear fission reaction, you have this leftover stuff that can be both radioactive as well as chemically active. It's just nasty stuff that you have to deal with. Nuclear fusion would solve both of these problems. It starts with simpler stuff although deuterium isn't always so easy to find, you don't have to make it. After fusion, you get something like helium, or helium-3.